<clears throat> so this week um, is more of a show and tell week for, for, for me to you. There's a lot of stuff I've been so excited to show you that Revit can do, but I needed you first to um, understand, you know, uh, where things were in Revit. And now that we've gone through two projects together, I feel like everybody's in a place now where you're starting to know where things are. Um, you probably don't have to ref uh, reference the videos quite as much. Um, that's where I'm hoping anywhere everybody's from. And I'm wondering if there are some questions that are starting to arise from some of you about like, what if I don't like the way this looks in Revit? Or what if I want this to look like this? How do I do that? So I'm going to try to cover some of those things. And so the good news is there's nothing due next week. And that's what Kim and I were just talking about when uh, uh, you all joined us. So nothing's actually due next week. So this week, think of it as more of like a catch-up week. But um, I am going to touch on things that we're going to talk about next week um, where we start to actually customize some families that are annotation families. Now, we're not going to do that this week, but I might reference that a lot. This week, I, I want to show you how to do things that you don't need to customize families for. I, I want to, uh, for instance, show you how to set up some view templates and why view templates make sense. I want to um, show you how to um, uh, modify your schedules appearances. So when you uh, put in schedules out of the box from Revit, they're really not very attractive. They're not, they could be better, uh, uh, line weights could be better on that. Uh, uh, certain things we can do to make it a little bit better looking on the sheet. So we'll look at those uh, schedule appearance. Um, I also wondered if anybody had any, uh, if the question was raised while you were doing the Craftsman project, you know, like, what if I don't want my whole entire floor to be all wood? Did anybody have that question come in your mind? Like, what if I don't want my bathroom to be wood? Um, those are the kinds of things we're going to cover, okay? Did anybody ask, uh, think of that question in their head while they're, I look like Angie were about to. I was more fighting the walls than caring about the floor. I am going to be real. Okay. When you mean fighting the walls, like getting the walls to join properly and things like that? Yeah. Okay. Did not even think about the flooring. I was just thinking well, about the walls. Well, you know, you get to a point where you, you are, you're fighting with the model at first and making sure everything looks right. And then you get to a point where you say, well, wait a minute. I don't want my floor in my bathroom to be uh, wood. I want it to be tile. How can I do that? Um, so I'm going to show you a few things, a few tips and tricks that allow you to apply some um, different uh, graphics to those areas so that you can represent that information and plan. Um, and we'll also talk about view ranges and plan regions. So view range allows you to change what you see in a view, how far down below a view and how far up above a view and where it's cut. But there's also a thing called a plan region. And a plan region is used in a situation where you, most of the plan is, is exactly where you want it to be, but there's this one section where there's a window that's up higher or, or something you want to see that's down lower that you want represented in that plan, but it's not showing up and we need to create a plan region just for that area to make that, that particular piece show up so that that plan makes sense. Um, and then I know we, uh, did I, 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 I can't remember if I ended up touching on topo solids in one of the videos for the craftsman or not. I did. Okay. So I, I am going to, if, if we have a chance then, um, uh, I won't do the topo solid because I couldn't remember what I did, but we will talk about those things. And if we have a chance, I have some other topics to add on to that um, in, in, so that we can get into um, discussing and talking about the appearance of Revit. So um, Revit, as you know, is a, uh, a Autodesk product, and it comes with some default settings. And just like any piece of software you use, the default settings are not always the desired settings. So um, we're going to take a look at how we can change some of those things. Okay, so speak up if you have some questions about it, and I'll tell you, oh, yes, that's what we're going to cover in the customizing um, annotations uh, uh, lecture next week, or or if it's something that we can cover uh, this week. But today is 
is kind of just introducing ourselves to that that concept of us being able to make changes to Revit now. Okay, so put that in your head. Um, and anything that comes up that you're like, you know what I really don't like about Revit, can I change that? Please ask, okay? And then we'll see, and then we'll, we'll kind of make a list of things, and we'll make sure that we hit on all those topics over the next couple of weeks. All right, so let me share my screen, and um, I have the Craftsman project up here with most of the annotations in place. Um, I've been, uh, I was trying to find the one where I had it complete, totally completed, um, but uh, the one that I could find was the one that I'd already customized the annotation. I didn't want to show you that yet. So if I'm missing a few uh, dimensions and things, that's why. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do first is we're going to walk through what your plan set should look like at this point. Um, save the project. So the sheets that I have set up in mine, and I've, I've modified mine a little bit because I ended up adding a, a deck and, and a side porch, and we can talk about that today too if we have time. I've got a lot of things on my, on my plate though here. Um, so I've got a foundation view. I've got a first floor plan separate from the second floor plan. Um, originally, we were trying to fit that on one sheet, and uh, now that I have this deck here that I've decided is going to be the access points for the front entry, the back entry, and the side living dining space, um, I needed to expand that that for first floor, and so um, uh, I had to put the second floor on, on a second page. And then I also separated my elevation so we could see that entire porch and deck in our elevations. And so I've got everything kind of set up the way I want it, on the sheets that I want it, but I'm not ex entirely happy yet with um, how everything looks graphically. I want to be able to modify those types of things. And uh, the last page is just a three eighths of an inch full section, um, and I probably would still do a a, a wall, a typical wall detail, but I might put that on another page with some, you know, stair details and things like that. Um, so for it, and when I say stair details, I mean the ones that are uh, from the deck, the outside stair details. You would need that for permitting to show that you've got your, you know, deck stairs drawn correctly with correct uh, rail heights and all that. So there would certainly be more details we would add to this set of plans for the Craftsman project to turn it into its full set of construction documents. Okay. But for now, we're just going to work with these sheets. Um, and one of the places that I want to start is the foundation. Okay. So in the foundation, right now, the way the foundation looks, do you have any idea that there is a deck on the right side of this, uh, this, this house? There's no reference to it whatsoever, okay? So that's one of the examples of things. Now, one of the things we would do here is show support for that. And so we would put in some, some um, um, circular columns. And I'm just gonna put an uh, overlay in here uh, so I can reference those circular columns in the right locations from where the uh, the deck is. So I probably go around and, and put some 12 inch um, concrete uh, columns, which I don't have, so let's load them. Columns would be under structural columns and I'll go under concrete and we'll just get some round um, round columns and I'll choose 12 inch diameter. Yeah, they're already set to 12. So I'm gonna place those columns um, and the, that that's going to help. That's gonna help us figure out where the, the uh, reference to our um, deck is going to be. But a lot of times I like to also show the deck outline. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of options on how to do that. So let me just get these references in here first. And I don't think we need another, well, we'll put one there anyway. All right, so we've got all of our columns in place. So that means I can get rid of that underlay. And so now I've got all those columns, but I don't have any reference still to where that deck outline is. So I have a couple of choices. I can change my view range in this area and show uh, information up high enough to be able to show that 
Uh, and that, the way to do that is to go into your view range here. And let's let's really make sure we understand the view range. I know I touched on it really early in the semester and tried to explain everything, but now that you've worked with a model, probably this is going to make more sense to you, right? So um, when we are we, when we are trying to come up with where our view ranges should be, the three critical places are how far up do we want to uh, to have the, uh, the the floor plan reference, which is misleading because how far up we want the floor plan to reference will allow us to see certain information that's happening on our ceilings or uh, hidden line information like soffits or upper cabinets and things like that. But that's not going to be where the walls are actually cut. Where the walls are cut are, is, is based on its cut plane. Cut plane is set anywhere from usually four feet above the finished floor to four and a half, five feet, somewhere around there. And I will usually move that a little bit to make it so I don't have to make a separate plan region. Um, so I'll usually, if I have a lot of uh, windows that have higher sill heights, I might have to move that up a little bit um, to make sure it's going through all the windows on that level that I wanna see the sill heights for. And then the bottom level is usually gonna stop at the level you're on unless you want to see further down below that. So this is a good example of that because um, in the foundation, we want to be able to see the slab, but below the slab, we want to also be able to see that footer. And so that's an example of something that we want to extend the view depth down to the bottom of footing so that we can see those, those uh, footer, footers in our plan. If I did not have this set that way, when I hit apply, you'll see the footers all now disappear in this plan. And that's not what I want. I want to have, be able to reference those footers, right? So I'm going to extend that down to bottom of footing or set it to unlimited. What does unlimited do? It just will continue to show anything happening below the house that happens at all anywhere from uh, the below the footer down to the center core of the earth, I guess. I don't know. So <laughs> whatever the depth is of anything, you're going to see it. So setting that to bottom of footing makes sense because then it's associated with a level. Okay. And no matter where I put that level, it will go there. Um, so once you have those set and they're set correctly for a view, um, one of the things we can play around with, however, is this top elevation is set to um, seven feet, six inches, which is just below the, the first floor, finished first floor. Um, so that we're not seeing any first floor information being referenced in the foundation, nor do we want to, right? If I were to change that so that I could see reference for the deck out here, and I were to change that to nine feet, you'll see what the problem is, is it's gonna start showing, let's do 10 feet. It's gonna start showing information here in the plan that we don't wanna see. Um, and so that's the issue. We wanna be able to see what's way up there. Let's try, I think the deck's even higher than that. Um, we wanna see maybe all the way up to 15 feet. Let me see if it just eventually shows the deck. Doesn't wanna show the deck for some reason. Um, so if I want to be able to see that deck in this view, I want to keep this at seven feet six so that it's not showing all those other things that we see in the upper level. And I may want to create a, a new view range for this area so that I can show what's going on and I can show the footprint of the deck in my view. So one way is to show the um, underlay the the underlay in a in a foundation view, it it actually could make some sense because then you're showing where things are referenced in that underlay um, and why we have our structure where we have it. So if I show the first floor underlay, then we're showing reference. The only thing that I think is confusing about that is I don't want anybody to miss read this and assume we're putting a kitchen in the foundation, we're putting all these walls in the foundation. And so that part of it is the part of it that to me doesn't make that work as well, okay? Um, now you you could, um, yeah, so let's get rid of that idea. That idea doesn't work, okay? Um, so the other way that we can deal with this is to go to the view tab and we can create something that's called a, a plan region. Now, what a plan region does is it allows you to um, create a boundary area that you want to show something different than the main floor plan. 
So I'm just going to create a boundary area around where I know the And I might have to fiddle with this a little bit. Okay, so there's the boundary area. Um, and then because I've created a boundary area, I have a new um, setting over here for view range extents. So let's edit that view range. And instead of having this associated with the top of slab, I want to associate this new view range with the first floor. So this, just this area is going to go up to the first floor and show us first floor information all the way up to 7 feet 6 inches. Now, I really don't need that. I don't need it to go up to 7 feet 6 inches. I only need it to go up to about um, 4 feet because I just want to show um, the deck, and I might adjust that afterwards. The cut plane over there doesn't really need to be be there. Um, so we can uh, associate that with the first floor and set the cut plane to the same height as the top offset. And then the bottom, we want to keep having that going down to the slab and the level below going down to bottom of the footing so that we see all of the columns that are holding up that deck on the outside. So I'm going to apply that and then hit OK and then hit the green checkbox and we're going to see what that does to that area. So now we have reference to where that deck is. The problem is, is the deck, the cut plane, is cutting through all of the um, the balusters on the deck, as well as all of the uh, the, the uh, newel posts. So it's showing a little too heavy. So this is where the cut plane and the view height that we have from first floor can be adjusted, so that all we're doing is seeing that that uh, uh, that information. Um, from just the uh, the deck down or that we want to bring that cut plane up so it's not cutting through the railing. So that's what's happening right there. But what we have now, and I don't know if you can see this, do you all see this, that there's a, a green dashed line around that new uh, plan region? So that's the plan region. So if I want to adjust it, I just simply select that plan region and I get that setting again over here and I can make adjustments to it. So let's bring this up a little higher and apply it and see if that makes improvements on how the plan looks in this view. All right, so the other things that we can do it, to improve on this is, I, I think this is, this is pretty good at this point. Let me just see if what happens if I bring this down to one foot and one foot. Yeah, that's better. Um, so now that we've got this kind of toned down a little bit, the other thing that we can do is override the graphics in the view for some of the elements that we have that are showing now, okay? So we don't want to necessarily see this at, with such dark lines because this deck is not at the same level as the foundation. So uh, in that view range, um, or uh, those items within that view range, we can select. So let's select the uh, deck floor decking, for instance. And I can right click on that, override the graphics in view by element, and make this half tone. So that is sort of like the same way of putting an underlay, but you have more control over the separate elements to decide how you want this to look. So it graphically represents the way that you want. So you see how that just put that, that grayscale on the decking so it's a little bit less pronounced. I would do the same thing with the rail system. So you can select one rail and let's go ahead and select them all for that matter. So we'll select all those rails, right click and do the same thing. I want to override the graphics in the view by element and set those to half tone as well. So now when I look at my foundation, um, I have where my foundation walls are going. And now I, I have uh, uh, the location for all of the columns that are supporting the deck. And I have a grayscale reference to what that's supporting above it. Um, and that to me represents what's happening there a little bit better than to just show where those columns are and not indicate where the um, 
where where the deck is actually located. The advantage of using a view range here um, is that uh, uh, if my deck uh, dimensions or size change, the view range is going to update with it, right? Um, if I were to have uh, skipped this view range and instead just, oh, I'm just going to draw and trace around the deck with a um, detail line, annotation line, and show that deck location and simplify that, the disadvantage of that is um, it's, it's not, you have to remember to go in and edit that if you've changed the location of the deck. So it, in one example, you can make it really, really simple by just putting a phantom line as a detail line around there and then say, that's my deck footprint. Or you can do what I just did and make a, a, a plan view region where you have more control over two different elements in your plan that might be showing up at two different levels. Okay. Does this make sense to everybody how you would, why you would want those two things? Um, uh, after seeing this, does anybody have any other areas they can think of that you were kind of hoping uh, you or uh, wishing that you had this kind of tool to be able to do that with? Can you understand where else you might use it? Because I know of a place on the second floor. <laughs> so let's go to the second floor. I like to have people like think about it a little bit and see where you'd make that leap. This is one way to handle the second floor. Don't show anything, just open to below. Now, if you wanted to, you know how to show what's going on down in that second, uh, first floor below, but you'd want to be able to probably set that to a grayscale like I just showed you. So you want to walk through it. If you want to walk through it again, we can, but in this example, I'd probably set my view re region to within the wall boundaries, and then you can show um, uh, the view depth going down to the first floor and show that furniture, set it all to grayscale so that we can show that that information is below this level. Um, again, if you were to use the underlay tool, all of the information from the first floor is going to be superimposed on your second floor loft area and be confusing. And that's why uh, you want that option to understand how to make a view, a view range when necessary. Um, so there's another area where you could try that out, okay? So view ranges, make sense? You see where you might use them and you know where to find them. Under view, plan views, make a plan region. Um, and that's the same place if I wanted to make a plan out of something that I didn't have a plan of over here, that's the same place we go. So it's the same exact tool, just click on the down arrow and you can pick one of the other options in this list. Um, for, for other things as well. So to, you know, start taking, taking a look at what else is in there for tools. Um, reflected sailing plans, structural plans, and area plans. If you wanted to be able to show um, an, an area key that identified what's rentable area versus what is common area and so on, that's a good, that's a good tool to use to do that with, okay? All right, any questions on view regions? Well, that was good. We can move on to the next topic. All right. Oh, oh for a minute there, I thought it was going to crash, but I think I'm okay. Let me hit save. <laughs> um, so let's uh, go on to the, uh, oh, let's look at first floor. So First floor is looking pretty good. We've got our deck reference now in our foundation on our first floor. Um, and we have our door and window schedule showing up on this floor. I think it's inconvenient to not have a door and window schedule on the second floor as well, because otherwise you have to have people going back and forth to see. So um, what I wanna show you how to do today is create a door and window schedule for the first floor and then create a door and window schedule for the second floor that will forever automatically populate because as soon as you associate a door or window with one floor or the other, it will pop into that schedule. Does that sound good? Yeah? All right, so we have to get into the existing door and window schedules. 
which should have everything in it that's in the project. So that's the other thing. Um, when you are working with door and window schedules, Everything that you, every single door and window that you have, whether it's tagged or not, shows up in your schedule, okay? So that automatically happens when you've, when you've created a schedule. If you don't have a schedule, it, di it didn't happen. But once you have a schedule and you have it set with the correct fields, so let's, let, let's really look at these fields now. So I'm going to go to the door schedule. And the fields I have set for the door schedule, because I'm really doing a very simple door schedule here, is mark which is different than the mark type. We'll talk about that in a minute when we look compared windows and doors. So mark is, is, um, a, is the uh, number that's associated with the door. When you place the door, it gets a random number associated with it. And remember when you were placing doors and you first tagged them, the numbers were just random and they were just were all over the place and you had to renumber them, all right? So when you place a door in a plan, Let's just look at this for a minute so you can see where to find all this information. So let's take this door number 13. And when we go into edit type, um, in the edit type settings, there is a type mark here that says 47. All right. But in the edit, uh, uh, the edit uh, window, without having to hit edit type, we have door mark, which says 13. What are the differences between those things? 13 is a unique number given to this door. We set that number because we just renumbered it, okay? And doors in general in architectural plans are usually given a unique number or uh, alphanumeric kind of numbering system for each and every door, even though the door is identical. Why that is, is because doors often need different hardware, even though they might be identical doors that we're installing. The door panel itself is identical, but the door's hinge side or handle side or hardware we're putting on the door, all kinds of things like that can be different based off of where we're placing them in the spaces. Now, this is definitely more... Uh, more of the case in commercial applications where some doors need to be fire rated, some doors need to have um, safety glass or openers or whatever. In residential, I stick to that still because it's, a, it's an AIA standard. We, you usually apply numbers or alphanumeric number system to doors and windows can be grouped by their types. And windows can be grouped by their types because they usually don't get unique hardware. And if they do, they just get a new uh, letter type. So uh, windows are not going to use this mark that is unique to each single door system. Um, so each door gets its own number. So that's why I can number the doors uniquely with each door that I select. That door instance, that single door, gets its own unique number, okay? The door type under mark type, if I wanted to label doors and have them all labeled the same like windows, then I would use a type mark instead of the mark. So that's the difference between mark, which is an individual number we give to every item, or type mark, which is going to be a common number we give to every item of that type. Do you, got, you, you all understand the difference between those that wording? Okay. So that's important to note first because that helps you to know what to put in your door and window schedules to get the result that you're looking for. So that first, um, that first field, mark, is the correct mark to put in here, not my mark type, but mark for doors. When we get into looking at windows, you'll see it says mark type or type mark instead of mark, okay? The next field is type. And type, as you can see, is showing both the width and the height together. And then family is showing the name of the family, or usually it's a description of the door as well. So I often use that as the same thing to describe the door. Um, and so those three things to me are, are, are good uh, fields to add. Now, some people prefer to have the width and the height separate in separate columns. And you can do that by taking that type field and sending it back over to this list. These are all 
uh, existing parameters in Revit that allow you to decide how you want to set up your schedule. And I, I would put in width and height. So let's find height here. And then you, you can move those things in the, play, in, the, in the position you want them to be within the schedule. Okay, so you can see what that did. Whoops, I still don't have that quite in the right place there. There we go. So now I have width showing up in its own column, height showing up in its own column. And because I've got it set to width and height separately, now instead of showing me the inches values of those doors, because before the door said 60 inches by 80 inches as a type, it's showing me the width and height in feet and inches. And I prefer that for doors. So that's why I like to use the separate width and height. Um, and so now I've got all of the columns that I need um, that I would, would like to use in my particular door schedule. Um, with one exception, I'd like to be able to have a comments column over here on the end. Now, a comments column, there are two types of comments columns. One of them is a um, just a generic comments. If I use that, I can make unique comments on each door if I would like, okay? This is where it gets confusing in Revit, in my opinion. <clears throat> However, uh, if I wanted to make common comments for each do door type, and I don't like doing this with doors because I have doors listed individually, so my comments probably want to be individual comments. If you use type comments, that will populate automatically the comments you make on one door. If there's another door of the same type, it will automatically put those same comments next to each door of the same type. So you can see where that's an advantage in some cases or a disadvantage in some cases, right? Okay, so I'm going to use comments on the door and add that at the end. And then lastly, I don't really like the naming convention for all of these things. I don't want them to be called family. That doesn't make sense to most people reading plans that aren't Revit users. You look, if a contractor comes and looks at a door schedule and reads up here the column that says family, they're not going to know what that means. <laughs> so we want to probably rename these to something that makes sense for someone reading these plans and not a Revit user. So door number, I usually change to symbol, the symbol I'm using in plan, width, um, I, it would stay the same, and height would stay the same, or if you want to use abbreviations, that's fine here. And then instead of family, I'm going to put here description. That's the door description. And then lastly, we'll put comments, but I just want to turn it into all caps. And I, I want to rename this too. This is going to become the first floor door schedule or floor one door schedule. All right. And we'll filter that to, to do the, to, to, to uh, show that information. Okay. So now I'm able to add comments, like uh, let's go across from the exterior door here. Raised, uh, single raised panel with side lights is an exterior door. And I may wanna put in comments like um, what I'm using for a lock set, bolt, uh, things like that, okay? So I'm gonna put in security lock, keyed, lock set, and deadbolt. Is deadbolt one word? It is, right? It's one word? I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's one word. Yeah. Um, so that's an example. So if I had another door that had the same, that was the same raised panel, and I do, and I had chosen type comments, that, that would automatically show up on that other, other door too. All right? But it doesn't. So... Uh, I have this set as comments because I want to be able to make individual comments for each one of these doors. So across from single raised panel with side lights for the back, I happen to want to say the same thing. And what's good about Revit is if you've already typed something out, that will show up in the list as as, as an item you can put in there um, and, and don't have to retype it, which is great. Okay. 
Um, the other thing we, we probably want to do is I'm going to close some of these things so that we can look at these two um, plans and uh, elevations together. And I'm not sure if any of you have tried this yet. But when you want to be able to see which door you're looking at in the schedule and which door it is in plan, if you set it up so you're looking at first floor and the door schedule at the same time, and go to view and tile your views. Now we can see the plan over here and you can see that the door that's highlighted is the door I have highlighted in my schedule. See how that door right there is the one that's highlighted. Okay, so I know, now know that's the bedroom to, to the um, first floor bedroom three and bedrooms, what kind of um, hardware door for, do we usually want for doors that are going to bedrooms? We want to be able to have a privacy lock on those maybe, right? So we put in privacy lock. Uh, and I like lever handles. Actually, I'm not going to bother with lever handles because I want lever, lever handles on all of my doors. So I'm going to include that as a note below my door schedule as a general note, all door, uh, you know, ha uh, door handles will be lever handles. All, you know, all doors, exterior doors have to be a, a, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? The U, the, not the uh, R value, but the U factor will have to be such and such. You can make a lot of general comments right below the door schedule. And I would do that instead of having to type it all out for each of the doors. So privacy lock set for uh, bedrooms makes sense. So as you go through, you can highlight and see that should have a privacy lock. So that should be one of the options you can grab and pull down, click on the next one and it shows you if that's just a closet, you can decide if you want to lock a closet or not, but usually you don't need to. Um, and then door five is to a bedroom. So that probably wants a privacy lock. So you get the idea, you can set up how, what you want for hardware now. So this could say uh, hardware instead of comment. Um, and then we can add another comment column uh, for uh, for comments, because I think there is a hardware field too that you could add if you had that those specific information, that specific information. Let me just see. Or you could create uh, keynotes that go along with it that say what you're buying for hardware, okay? So the point is, you want this schedule to be set up so it's showing the right information. So now we want to turn this into a schedule that's just going to show us the first floor doors and that's it, okay? So I wanna duplicate this schedule before I do that. I can duplicate a schedule just like I can duplicate a view. And I'm gonna rename the new schedule, floor two door schedule. So I have a copy, and now we've got floor two door schedule that we have open. I'm going to close that and open up floor one schedule, which is already open. And now I can filter what I want to see for doors. So I have to add, I have to ha add a column that is going to be able to be a hidden column. Um, and so the first thing I have to do is add what I'm going to use to filter those doors from the first floor to the second floor. And the best way for me to do that is to filter by level. So if I grab this level um, from available fields and put it over here, it's gonna show up at the end of my schedule. So the level shows up at the end of the schedule like so. And then it shows me what's on first floor and what's on second floor, right? So now that I have that there, I'm not gonna, I don't need to show that view because that's redundant. I don't need to show that this is on level one. If you're looking at the floor plan, you look at your schedule. So um, I'm only using it to filter the doors that I don't wanna see. So the next thing, once I have that level in there, that level column in there, if you go to filter, we can filter based off of level, equals first floor only, okay? And then once I do that, all the second floor doors disappear and they don't show up in this view, okay? 
Um, and at this point, I probably would renumber my my doors so that I've got, you know, a, a numbering system maybe for first floor and a numbering system for second floor, whatever. Um, or you can leave them numbered in the way that you want. You can get creative. <laughs> All right. So I've got uh, my first floor doors are showing up here. I don't really need to see this column anymore. So I can highlight that column and go over here and hide it, hide the column. So now I've got a first floor door schedule that that's the what I want to see on my first floor plan. So on the first floor plan, it says floor one door schedule and it came in all messy and it came in all messy because um, all of these descriptions just need a little bit more room. So we need to uh, expand the descriptions until we can see them all in one, one row. And then we need to expand our columns wide enough to see them in one row. I find it looks a lot neater to have them be in one row like that. So this door schedule might need to move down here, which is fine. Just kind of move some things around. And we, we now have our floor one door schedule. So on the second floor, we want to take floor uh, two door schedule and put it on this level but it just hasn't been filtered yet. So this is saying floor two door schedule. I'm gonna go to the floor two door schedule and I need to add the field. So uh, let's hit edit and add the level field to this one. You're gonna get to see me do this twice, which is good. Shows all the different doors on the second and third floor. Go to filter. And this time we want to filter the level it, that equals second floor, okay? And by the way, these say equals, does not equal, is above, or is, a, uh, is at or above, is below. So there's a lot of different ways that we can filter if you have a situation where you want to filter something that is kind of a combination of things or... Um, it, you know, I want all the second floor doors that are, are, are pivot doors. Or I don't know, whatever, like <laughs> you can filter also based off of name, um, or, uh, anything that, that allows you to, to get, to get to the, um, grouping that you want to get. So this goes down to just two doors, which is fine. And if I put that door on that second floor there, we, there it is, it's on the second floor already. Um, I'll probably put that down in about the same place that I have the first uh, the first floor one. And you do want to pay attention to the widths of these columns. It really looks pretty crummy when you've got a, a, a word that's like kind of been cut off um, and not showing what you want it to show. So this level is still showing. So I've got to go to the door schedule for second floor and make sure I've turned off that level. So you just highlight that column and hit that hide button, hide column. And then it should automatically update on the second floor with that new, that new setting, okay? So now you know how to filter and set your door and window schedules. I'm not gonna do this with the window schedule. It will be exactly the same process with the window schedule. And you all know how to itemize your, your doors or um, do the count on the window side because we covered that in the Craftsman project. Um, so, uh, that I feel is one of the more useful things to know about with schedules, um, cause then it gives you a lot more power of where you want to show things and what you want to show. This is also really important to know how to do when we get into doing projects that are, um, existing conditions versus new construction. You don't necessarily want to uh, show all the doors that you that you are using in your project that are existing. You probably only want to tag and show in a schedule the doors that are the new doors. So you can filter out um, based, on, based on phase. That's another way to filter. You can base on phase. So no existing doors show up, but I want all my new doors to show up on this level. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. So one of the things I really don't care for uh, about the Revit default schedule is um, the, uh, the, the font that's being used. And I really like to have some kind of banner up here at the top to make that a little bit more distinctive when we're looking at it. Um, so this is where we're gonna get into the schedule appearance, okay? So let's go in back into the floor schedule and we have, I'm gonna, turn off um, the tile view now. I don't think we need it anymore. We'll go to tab view. 
And so in the door schedule, you have um, the uh, header of the entire schedule. Then you have the, um, actually, I think this is called the title. And then this, these columns up here are called the header. And then you have the data cells. So those three things that you can change each one of those things and have the font size get bigger or smaller in each of those levels, if you will. And then you can also change your font if you wanted it to have a different font for the title and then have a, a more standard uh, font that you're using everywhere else for a uh, similar font probably than your dimensions and, and, and other annotations in your project. So to control that, if we go to the Appearance tab, we have um, lots of things that we can do right here with the Appearance. So one of the first things that I like to do, because I don't like my schedules to take up any more room than they have to, and I don't care for this space that uh, Revit automatically puts between the headers and the, and the data cells. Now, if you like that space, go ahead and keep it. But if you don't like that space, turn off blank row before data, and it's going to get rid of that little gap. So see how that collapsed. And when we go to the first floor plan, um, there's there's the difference between the window schedule right there that hasn't been updated with the gap and the door schedule now that doesn't have a little gap between it. I didn't realize I hadn't fixed those two headers. Um, so that's one of the appearance things that I like to fix. get back into the uh, door schedule. Um, if I want the appearance for my text to be different, there's title text is the top piece. Header text is the headers for each of the columns. And then body text, I thought it said cells, but that may be AutoCAD. Body text are all of the texts that are in the individual cells, OK? So right now, um, we have actually two shutoffs here if I don't want to show a title. I don't know why you wouldn't want to show a title on a schedule. To me, that's kind of important. And don't show header. I would want to show header so that we understand what we're looking at below each of the columns. But you could shut those off. If you had a schedule you wanted to create that you only needed a header for, or you only needed um, a, a title for, I guess I suppose you could, you could set a schedule up that does that. Um, Show stripes, uh, uh, stripe rows on sheets is um, the stripe rows this way to show on sheets. Um, and you have control over stripe colors and thickness for the grid lines. So let's start here with the graphics, grid lines. The grid lines are the lines that are defining the, the table, basically, of the schedule. And right now, they're set to thin lines. If you click on grid and header and footer spacers, um, I think it ends up putting the extra grid in the header and footer spacers if you have headers and footers that are associated with your schedule. We don't happen to have them in this situation. so. But grid lines are all the lines that are inside the schedule. Outline is the outline of the entire schedule. We might want to turn on and set that to medium, for instance. So now we have a nice thick line weight around our schedule. And then all of our lines inside are a thin line weight. So let's tile this again, I guess, so that we can see this happening on our plan as we look at it. So we'll tile these two things, view and tile. So we want to see how this uh, schedule behaves as we make these changes. All right, so that's. Um, that's one of the, the things that I, I think makes an improvement to the schedule, how it prints. Um, uh, and I might even do a wide line for that, uh, for that outline. Um, then uh, there's really not much else you can do here besides those things. I guess you can change the uh, stripe rows. Um, and stripe rows allows you to add stripes uh, every other line, I think. So you got second row stripe color and first row stripe color. So first row stripe color is white. And second row stripe color, we might say, is gray. And that gives you a, maybe it makes it easier to read. 
the schedule when we when we do that sort of thing. So let me see if it is even showing up. Did that happen? Oh, I didn't turn it on. There we go. So first row stripe color, second row stripe color, show stripes on sheet. There we go. So you can see now we've got our stripes showing up here. And um, I don't know if that makes an improvement to read it or not. Maybe it's easier to, to follow along when you do that. Um, so that's how we can fill stripes in by data cells or the body of the text. Um, you can also take and uh, under appearance, um, we can change our text styles, so text style for the um, the header. Uh, if I, I, I only have these three choices of Arial, Arial, and Arial, different sizes right now, but if I wanted to, I can, this is one of the things we'll do next week. I'm not gonna do this yet, but we're gonna pick a font we prefer other than Arial, and no one's allowed to use Arial. You have to pick something else other than Arial, okay? And you also have to pick a font that is really, readable. The reason I want it to be changed is I want you to know how to do it, okay? So we're going to change and pick a new font. Once you pick a new font, that becomes your new default font, and then you'll see how that happens, and those new choices will show up here instead of the Arial, okay? But if I want this title text, instead of being just schedule default, I want it to be quarter inch up there, and I want the header to be eighth of an inch, and then I want the body text to be three thirty seconds, once you make those changes, this in, makes that header much bolder, more defined. I find it looks a lot better. And then the size of the, the um, uh, schedule gets a lot smaller too because the text is smaller now in the body, whereas everything was just set to the same size before, okay? Um, so those are the only appearance changes that happen within the the settings over here. The rest of it that, that I'm going to show you is all going to happen with the buttons above when we're in a schedule view. So I'm going to go back to a tabbed view so we can focus on just the schedule. And we're going to select the top row here and um, go into modify schedule. If I want to, um, where's the shade? I always lose it <laughs> right here. Shading, shading specifies the background color of the selected cell. So if I wanna shade that top title area with a bolder color like that, I can, I can do that by just selecting that cell and adding that shading, okay? So we may want to do the same thing with each of these cells, but I may want to go every other one is shaded um, or just shade that the same way as the door schedule because then that the pattern is the same. So let me see if I can select more than one. And once you pick these colors, you should keep track of what you set them to because otherwise, let me just see what I set this one to. This is at, uh, 170, 170, and 170 for red, green, and blue, and then 160 for hue and lumens. Now, I might want to reuse that again, so I can hit add and add it to the custom colors that I have over here, and then it lets me reuse that exact same color without having to memorize those numbers. So then we can select that one and hit shading, and now we can pick that custom color and shade each one of the headers. Let me see if I can pick more than one. So that doesn't look like I'm picking more than one, but I'm gonna check to see if it did pick more than one. No, it doesn't. So for some reason it won't let you pick more than one, but. So let's see how this looks when we, uh, with these changes that we've made on our, on our floor plan, our first floor plan. There's where we started and there's where, what it looks like now. I think it's an improvement <laughs> and it can improve even more if we wanted to get into like playing with the fonts and things like that, which we're going to do next week. Okay. So you, there's a little bit more information now that you know about schedules. What else can I do with schedules? Um, one last thing I want to show you is schedules that are, are, can be quite useful 
is um, uh, using some of the calculation tools that we have within the, um, the, the filters, the sorting and grouping. So under sorting and grouping for doors, um, we are sorting by mark, so it lists the doors in ascending uh, order. And if I wanted to get a grand total of something, like a quantity of doors at the bottom, or um, if, I if I wanted to add, like, for instance, a parameter that has a cost for each door and gives us a total for cost, I, I don't like doing that in my plans because I don't like to get involved in that. <laughs> But as an example, <laughs> um, so grand totals, if you add grand totals, you can have grand totals count and totals, totals only. These are all different little things that you can add that will show up at the bottom of the schedule. So let's go with count or just totals only. And there it says, all right, we got 11 doors total. Because even though this this uh, this has doors one and it ends in thirteen, there's not actually that's not in order. Remember, because the the doors are numbered, there's some on the second floor, some on the first floor. So this tells you there are eleven doors on the first floor, and you can you can in, include that in your schedule, and that will appear as your grand total down here too. All right. So there's some ways to add some calculation information to your door schedules if you would like and that will automatically update as we add doors or, or doors to our schedule okay any any questions or anything in particular someone would like to, to that you're trying to do visually with your door schedule that you'd like to know how to do that anybody can think of that I didn't show you Okay, um, then let's go on to well, it's two thirty. Do we need a break before I go on to the next thing? Because I want to go to view templates next. We can take a quick break. Okay, take a quick break, and uh, we'll be back in ten minutes. So two forty. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started again. So uh, the next topic is view templates. View templates are a way for us to get control over our views and set things so that um, we don't have to spend so much time turning off this layer or that layer on each view every single time, okay? So I'm going to show you, um, I think I'll start with the elevations, and then I'm going to show you how I use view templates in different, the different design phases in my project so that I don't have to worry about um, showing more than I want to a client when I'm not ready for them to see all of the dimensions and all of the whatevers that I might have put on there and all the sections and the and the elevation tags and so on and so forth. So um, we're gonna take a look at this elevation. We're gonna break it down with like, like I want these elevations to um, to show, uh, so, to be shown kind of more in a presentation format than the rest of my plans. So um, I wanna create two types of elevations. I want one that's going to be more for construction documentation like this one is beginning to look. Um, where I'd want to see all the levels call out. I want to have some dimensions for where the sill of the windows, the head of the windows, um, and so on uh, are happening on our elevations and include of all, all of our call outs for our exterior finishes. But what if we wanted to show presentation version of these elevations, you know, pretty versions, in other words. So I'm going to duplicate one of the views. Um, the elevation views. Let's take this front elevation and duplicate it. So we can leave one in the same format it was before, and then you can see what happens to it when we make these changes. We'll rename this and call this um, um, 
front elevation uh, preliminary. Okay, just to differentiate it from the other one. Um, so in a preliminary uh, plan set, what I'm showing maybe schematic design or design development, I would probably not necessarily need to show all of this information levels wise. We're not, we don't need to get into that level of detail. So um, one of the things that, that's one of the things I'd wanna turn off. Um, I want to think about how I want this looking on the sheet so it really shows the different the different um, uh, depths that these walls are at. So I'd want some shadows being cast on this. And then I want to try to create a view style that really just uh, showcases this elevation um, as best I can. Okay. So I'm going to um, start off by going into the um, view template uh, setting, which you'll find there's an identity data section. And under that, right under that, it says view templates. And we're going to take a look at the existing view templates that are, are built with Revit. Okay. So in Revit, you have a, an architectural elevation template. And we'll just click on that and see what happens to our plan when we do that um, and hit OK. Nothing happens. <laughs> Nothing happens because there's no real major change to settings. And one di thing did happen, actually. This base point, this project base point showed up, and I probably don't want to show that because that's – as soon as you put something like that into a an elevation and the clients look at they're like, what – they focus on that. What is that? <laughs> so you don't, you don't, you don't want to show anything you don't want to show. So let's go back into it. But here's – while I have this view template turned on, um, if I type visibility and graphics, everything here is grayed out now. And the reason it's grayed out is it's now going to get controlled through that view template, okay? So I'm going to hit cancel, and we're going to create our own version of this view template. We want it to behave a certain way. So I'm going to expand these so that we can see everything. So the first thing that um, I, I don't like is I don't want my view templates to necessarily be associated with any one particular scale. I want to have the ability to set the scale of that view to anything I want, but keep all the other settings the same for all of the other views that are similar views. So all my elevations right now in my schematic design phase, um, so I'll rename this architectural elevation right now. I'll just make a copy of it. We're going to call this um, schematic elevations, okay? So that's my view template name, schematic elevations. So the first thing I'm going to want to turn off is I don't want this view template to control scale. So all you have to do is get rid of the checkbox, and it will not include that as part of the view template. That allows you then the flexibility to change the scale down here. You don't have to go into the view template to change it, okay? Um, the other... Uh, the other setting that I, I would change would be my detail level, and I would set that to at least medium, least medium. And with elevations, if you, depending on how big the scale of the elevation is, I you may want to have more control over that to change it to medium or uh, fine. So if you get to a point where you're you're wanting to change that and you and you uh, don't want it to be the same for all of your elevations, that's another thing we can say. We don't want to include that in our template. So anything you don't want included in your template, just remove the checkbox from next to that particular item, and it will become available when we type in visibility and graphics, or it will become available down here for us to change, okay? So uh, scale I, I don't like including. I'm going to start off with making this um, medium um, detail level. And um, the, the next few choices are going to be based off of how I want elevations to appear, not necessarily how I want plans to appear. This is why we're calling it schematic elevations. So VG override for the model, what kinds of things do I want to see and that I don't want to see as for model items in the elevation? Um, and if we go through the list of things that are here, you might see some things that you don't think, uh, well, no matter what, I don't want to see that in my elevations. Anything like that, you can turn it off. 
and make sure it's not showing, okay? If it's items that you wouldn't show anyway, I wouldn't bother going through it, but if you notice something that keeps showing up that you don't want to appear in your elevations, you can turn it off here, and that's going to happen in every elevation we assign this view template to, okay? So the next category is annotations, and this one is one that I usually set things for elevations, because I personally don't like seeing my sections in my elevations. I find it really distracting. I prefer to see my section cutouts only in plan. That's just my preference. So I like to turn off sections in all of my elevations. And because this is a set of schematic elevations, I also want to turn off my level. I'm going to turn those off as well. And let's apply that so far. Uh, yeah, so you can see what's happening now to the elevation as we do that. It looks so much cleaner, okay? Um, and if we move on to the next item, we've got analytical model, which I don't have a situation where I'm using an analytical model. So anything that you're not using, just skip it and go on to the next one. Overrides of imports. Um, this will be probably something we would be concerned about if we had drafting views and things like that we were bringing in, or we had image files we were bringing in, or background image. That would all be imported items. How do we want those imported items to, be, to show up in this view template would, would be where we would change the settings there. Uh, override filters. Let's just check to see what's there. This is overriding, um, you know, particular things within the um, layer system. Don't really need to do anything there. But then this next one, I do want to make a change to. So this is shadows. How do I want shadows to affect my elevations? I want to cast shadows on my elevations. So I want to show the shadows on my elevations. And when I do that, immediately I see so much more about what's going on with the depth of these walls by just adding those shadows, OK? And then the next category is um, sketchy lines. So if you are of the ilk that, man, you know, every time I show somebody my Revit drawings, they're way too slick, and my, my clients think that, there's n that, that the drawing's are already done, and they can't make changes, and they're afraid to ask you to move a wall. If you want to make it look sketchier, you can turn on Enable Sketch Lines, and you can add a little bit of a jitter and add a little bit of extension lines to your lines. I'm really going to exaggerate so you can see this. So this, yeah, as you can see, this gets kind of like unreadable at a certain point. You can see what happens. And I don't think Revit does a, a super great job of this. But if it's something you like the looks of, you can mess around with those settings um, and make something look a little bit sketchier than, um, than, than the, the standard. So just turn that off if you don't want that happening or set them back to zero. Um, but th that's your choice, okay? Next one is depth queuing, and depth queuing for elevations might come in handy. So if you've got an elevation where you've got a lot going on, and there's a pretty good sized building, and you have a wall way back here, and you've got a wall really close to you, and you want to show that wall that's way back there with a little bit lighter line weights, you can set, set your depth queuing. So depth queuing, um, if you turn it on, Far is set to the uh, farthest distance of 100 feet, and near is set to zero. So if you say, like, I want this at around anything that's more than uh, 20 feet back, let's say, I want to um, set a percentage of darkness to that so it's a little bit little bit lighter or a little bit dark, less dark, you know, so you can control how you want those to, to appear. So if we do that, I don't know if you can tell here. Let me hit OK so far so you can tell. See how that wall back there now is a little bit more grayscale than the wall in the front? So it's not only adding a shadow, but it's also lightening that wall to say that's further back than the rest of the items. If we turn on line weights, we might see that even more, OK? So these are all things that you can play with and decide, do you like this or do you not like this? So depth queuing allows you to, to have a little bit control, more control over those line weights in your elevations. Um, lighting, 
is right now set to um, a default setting um, in session lighting, it's called. And if you wanted to uh, control or set a, 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 a different default, you have sunlight from the right, sunlight from the left at this point because we haven't created a sun set, uh, set up in this project yet. So this is all I would do at, at, at this level. So let me just see, show you what happens if we pick from right or from left, I think the shadows are just going to shift a little bit. And I'm kind of liking what happened there on the stairs with that change in shadow. Um, so you can decide where you want those shadows to go. You have a little bit of, of control there. Um, under lighting, uh, photographic exposure is not something you're going to deal with unless you're in um, the um, model display that, that is set to realistic. And model display set to realistic is great looking, but it does definitely slow your computer down. So, and it also won't always print very well. So if you're taking these 3D graphics, really beautiful images, and you don't have a good graphics card, or you don't have a good, um, you know, uh, uh, system at home where it's taking all that data and can put it into the printer, the printer will drop lines or not quite show everything it's supposed to show with your elevation. So um, model display or beware, okay? Be careful of that. Just see how it functions before you set it to something uh, where it's cranked up to the highest resolution and things like that, okay? So um, if we set that to realistic, uh, that, that might cause issues, in other words. So to cancel there. And lastly, background. We could set a background to this and show a background. We have a gradient where we can add a background, and it kind of just puts this in some kind of environment so that it looks like the house is sitting in an environment. You can set it to a sky, which will show a realistic sky, or you can create an image and put an image in the background. Um, gradient, I think, is useful because you can control the gradient and you can, um, I think you, you even have the ability to set the gradient a little bit within the views. Um, but the, I'm going to leave it blank for now, none. And lastly, we have, um, yeah, phase filters and, and other things like this that come along uh, later on in the semester uh, that we might want to talk about, okay? So I've got all of my view uh, set up for all my elevations now. This is how I want all my elevations to look. Um, when I go into my uh, elevations views, I can control now whether or not the, I want them to be that schematic look or if I want them to be um, set up for more uh, designed uh, documentation. So change the view template in this view to the schematic elevations, and all of those settings just automatically get set, okay? I can also select all of the elevations here without having to go into each one of them. I can select them using the control key and set them all to the same view template at once, which is also an advantage. So now I've saved myself quite a bit of time because if I had to do that to each one of the elevations, it would take me a lot longer to set up all these elevations, okay? Whoops, that one needs to be cropped. Um, and as, as with everything else, always double check to make sure things are actually doing what you were thinking they were gonna do. And what I'm noticing on some of these elevations is the line work is getting awfully light and it might be too light for printing. So that you'll know if you've got it right once you've tried these things out, printed it out and see if it, see if it looks right, okay? But you all see the idea of how you would use a, a view template and how useful those view templates are. Um, they allow you to make changes from one view to another really quickly. So that's where I wanted to show you that in a plan. So if we go to the first floor plan, um, I may not want to show all the dimensions and all the elevation tags and all the sections and so on for a schematic floor plan preview. So I would create a duplicate view of this, rename this, 
preliminary design, floor one, and I might want to create a view template that shows the um, the uh, the walls and the windows and doors, but doesn't show any of the dimensions yet. Okay, so if I pick my view template here, and let's start with a architectural plan, but I'm going to make a um, duplicate of that and call it schematic plan get rid of this uh, uh, scale because I might want to change the scale to a lot of different things set that to at least a medium detail and this is where in model I might do some overrides that show the walls pochet so if and I if I want to keep those pochets I can do that but um, if I want to show the walls postcade and um, have that really pronounced a little bit more, I can go down to the wall layer and across from walls in the cut patterns right here, I want to set an override so that the background is set to a solid fill kind of grayscale like this, okay? Now what that's going to do is just when I'm showing my schematics, it's going to fill those walls in with a nice grayscale and just make it a lot easier to read those plans for, for uh, defining those spaces, okay? So I now have a, a, you know, if I wanted to go into second floor and create a duplicate view of that, all I've got to do is rename this second uh, preliminary design floor two. And I only need to go up here and change it to that new schematic plan view template and all the walls automatically change and uh, you know put in those details. So I think on that first floor, the uh, annotation things under annotation, they were already turned off. Let's just see if dimensions are turned off. See, the dimensions didn't show up, and I'm not sure why they turned off, but I might not want to show dimensions. I might not want to show um, elevations, the elevation tags, and I might not want to show sections. And then all of those things disappear. Um, and you can turn off a whole bunch of other things. So now I've got a, a preliminary uh, schematic that I can just switch back and forth from. So in floor, first floor, I might want to create a temp view template for um, construction documentation's architectural plan. So if we pick the architectural plans um, and rename that, let's say arc plans, architectural plan um, CD, it's a good name to give it for construction documentation. Um, we'd wanna go through and make sure that the things are turned on here that we wanna see for that or start from scratch and make sure our uh, dimensions and things like that are showing in that plan. Um, and that's the difference between the two. Now in this, if you felt like the, um, the post-shade walls looked better presentation-wise, and also it would look better in in your um, in your uh, construction documentation. You could make that change to your visibility and graphics overrides here as well, and keep that. All you need to do is just go down to that walls layer and do the same thing we did before. Click click on it, add an override, set it to a solid fill, um, and then. Uh, make sure, you know, and notice I'm, I'm setting the background of the walls to a solid fill. So that way you're still seeing all the layers in the wall system. Um, and then you wanna make sure you're setting the, the uh, grayscale for that, for those post shade walls so that they're not too dark. Um, and I often will usually use a much lighter gray for existing walls and then a much darker gray for new construction. And that's how you can differ differentiate between uh, existing and new construction. So now we've got a combination of those wall system. What happened there? That didn't work. Why didn't it work? C 
CD. Oh, it's because I didn't do it under model. Let's see. Oh, that's why. Did you see what I did there is I put it under window and that's not going to work. So let's clear the overrides. We want to go under walls and do it. That will, let's clear overrides here. Why isn't that clearing the overrides? There we go. And this will work much better if we put this under the walls and not the windows. So now we've got our post shade walls, but when we zoom in, we want to be able to see the line weights within the wall system. Um, under CD plan, the reason we're not seeing those line weights is it's set to coarse. Make sure it's set to medium or fine, and those line weights will show up. See the lines just showed up, okay? So um, view templates, they save you time but you have to set them up correctly to begin with, and then they save you a whole bunch of time. So you might spend some time setting up a view template exactly the way you want it, but once you have it and you create a template file out of this project when we're done with it, then you have all the view templates that you want to use in a project going forward, okay? Any, any questions about view templates and how they would be used? Anybody have an example of, yeah, Margaret? Can you explain again about the checkbox where it's, uh, with the column included? Okay, yeah. Actually, I'm gonna show you what I mean by the uh, having the, let's take this architectural CD plan, okay? And we're gonna in keep, all right, it's already included. This is perfect. We'll leave this one at quarter inch equals a foot, okay? Um, and let's let's say I wanted to um, uh, in the second floor plan, I wanted to use that same view template, but I wanted to create an enlarged view of the kitchen. Let's do that, okay? So I'm going to create an enlarged view of the kitchen. So I'm going to do a view call out so I can detail the kitchen. And that created a call out view for me right here. It says first work call out. I'm going to rename that enlarge kitchen plan. And I might put that on a sheet for um, in like let's create an enlarged kitchen sheet for enlarge uh, enlarged views. And those are usually uh, in the four hundreds. A 4.0, 4.1 we'll put, and we'll just say enlarge plans. Enlarge plans and interior elevations. That, that might be what we would use that sheet for, okay? So I can drag and drop that view, that enlarged kitchen plan view here, and I if I want to show it the same way that I'm showing the view template, this is what's going to happen. So automatically, whenever you create an enlarged view of something, the enlarged view will take whatever scale it was started at and double it. So because I started with a quarter, it's going to set the kitchen at half an inch equals a foot, OK? Um, if I want to apply that view template to this plan, and I go to view template here and apply it, uh, architectural CD plan, Watch what happens to the scale. Boom, down, which I don't want, right? I don't want that included in my template. So what I want to do is go into the um, first floor plan so that I have uh, access to that template. And I want to not include the scale in that view template. Then if I don't include the scale, I now have the, the ability to set those same layer controls, but have the ability to change the scale down here to whatever I want, okay? And that's the difference about having something that you want included in the, in the view template versus not included in the view template. So you just take it away from the view template if you don't want it in there. Another good example of that, by the way, Margaret, is you maybe want to have control over um, the, um, things like, 
uh, at the view range in the individual view. So that would be another item that you would take out of the view template and, and make sure it's available for you to change here. So if I go down and look for the view range, see how the view range is grayed out. Whole bunch of stuff is grayed out here. I can't control it by individual view. And that's good if you want every view to be the same exact format every time, but some things you don't want, you want the flexibility. So that's all you're doing is looking at, do I want the flexibility to be able to change that per view, or do I want that to be changed in universally in any view I apply this view template to? And that's how you're going to know whether or not you want that checkbox next to it or not. Okay. So I would, considering that, I would probably turn off that view range here and make that not included in my template for, for any templates. Because I generally like to be able to control view range by view, because there's usually unique things happening in that view that you want to change that view range for. So I'm going to turn off the view range in, in all these template views. And now I have control over changing that view range that became an active button again, even though I have a view template applied, OK? Um, view templates, give them a try. Um, definitely something I would play with for uh, this week and next week when you're, you're customizing Revit. These are all things you're making decisions about. How do I want, how do I want uh, my plans in, in to look like? Uh, you get to start customizing those things and making them look the way you want, okay? Um, so there's no right or wrong necessarily. Um, if you're doing something that I don't think you, meets normal AIA standards or graphic standards, I'll let you know. But um, if you decide you want your walls pocheted and somebody else doesn't, I'm not going to say one is wrong or the other. That's your decision for the style that you want um, You want things to, to, to look at, look like when you place them on the sheet. OK. How much time do we have? All right, I think we have just enough time to show you how to use um, uh, some mat some materials editor things. And that is where you might want to um, change the view uh, graphic representations of things in a plan, let's say, to change the material you're using in one room or another. So I'm going to just, this is going to be really bare bones, very simple. We'll talk more about materials and rendering and things like that a little later on in the semester. Um, so let's go to that preliminary design floor plan. And this is great, too, to know that whatever, um, whoops, whatever I do um, can be It can be edited. Uh, no, I don't know if that's true or not. Let me. I better not say that before I check it. Um, I was thinking it could be edited by view, but it might not be. It might actually be a model situation. So we'll find out here in a minute. So let's use uh, the this this uh, bathroom area as an example. So I like wood floor everywhere else. That's fine. I want, might want a different wood a different material here in this entry area in the the front and the back. And I might want a different material in the bathroom, for instance. And I'm just going to use tile as an example to show you how to do this. Um, when you create your floor system, your choices are to just create a finished floor. Um, and we have oak here as an example. And unfortunately, it doesn't let you pick different materials per room. It just doesn't do it that way. So one of the ways you can control your um, flooring or your materials is by just calling this floor material quote unquote finished floor and setting it to the typical thickness of finished floor throughout and removing any type of um, um, hatch pattern. I prefer to leave this as oak flooring because most of the time uh, most of the time people choose wood floors for residential applications to their floor system and then we only change certain areas. So I'm picking a floor um, pattern that I, I feel like is going to be used in the majority of the floor so I just don't have to edit it. Uh, one of the things I dislike about Revit is the floor lines on the floor plan to me are too too strong. 
I don't want them to show up so so dark. So you can make changes to that in your visibility and graphics template, um, view template. So if I go into the schematic design template and I go into model elements and look for floors, across from floors, let's expand that, we have um, the floor surface pattern we're looking at. I may want to set to um, a much lighter, much lighter uh, uh, color. So if I keep this at visible, but I set the color to, um, let me see here. That might not be the way we want to do it. Let's actually just go across from floors and set them to half tone. That's a better way to do it. That's a, probably the simplest way to do it, okay? So once you do that, every floor, regardless of what it is, is going to show up a little bit less intensely and be, I, to, in my opinion, less distracting, okay? Um, now let's get into creating a new material for within this space. There are some tools under the Modify palette that we haven't really had a chance to get into yet. And one of them um, is, is called Split Face. So if I click on that Split Face tool and pick a surface, so let's pick the, um, the floor. And you might have to go over here and choose to select by face to get this to work. So let's select by face for Modify select by face, then it's going to let you select the floor. And as soon as you select the floor as your surface that you want to split the face of, we're going to go here and create a rectangle. And I'm just going to match that rectangle so that it's matching the footprint of the floor within the bathroom like that. And to lock or not to lock, I would lock in this situation because I want that um, split face pattern to move with the walls. If I move the wall, I want the split face pattern to go with it, okay? So yeah, let's lock in this situation. Hit the green checkbox, and it seems like nothing happened. <laughs> but believe it or not, we have actually split this up so that this little area can be selected separate from the rest of the floor, okay? And so the next thing we're going to do is use this tool here right below that split face. There is a paint tool. If you click on that paint tool and we type in a material like tile, um, let's see if we have any tile. We do. So we have um, porcelain tile, it looks like tile stone and ceramic mix, and mosaic gray tile. Let's pick the mosaic gray tile just for kicks and giggles. So select that material, and then if you pick in that area, you can see that it highlights. Um, it puts the pattern that that particular material is associated with inside that space. So I just painted that material and overrode basically the graphics symbol representing the, the uh, wood floor. I just overrode just the graphics. So it doesn't change what this is going to look like in section. It doesn't say, okay, now this is tile and section or anything like that. It's just a graphic change in plan. That's it. Okay. Um, this particular mosaic tile doesn't show a pattern. So let's try the next one. I'm going to try the tile um, and pick the same area. And then you can see the pattern for it for the tile in there. Okay. Again, a little later on, we're going to talk about how we can create our own custom materials with our own patterns that go with it. So if I wanted a tile that was a one foot by one foot tile, how do I get it? How do I make it? Or And how do I display it? If I want it to be diagonal instead of 90 degrees, we'll go over those things a little bit later on in the semester. But for now, you can experiment with this and you can make a different material in the kitchen. So let's say we want to make a different material in the kitchen. You're going to use that split face. Let's do this one more time. Split face, pick the floor, and place lines around the boundaries of where you want that pattern to go. So let's pick, I'm just going to do this. Well, let's do this, actually, because I don't care if this goes underneath the stairs. So I want that to go right there. And then um, it will bark at me because 
These yellow lines that you're seeing are the boundaries of the actual floor area, the floor boundaries. And so these pink lines can't go beyond that. So you just have to adjust the pink line locations until they meet up with those yellow lines. And then when you hit the green checkbox, that split that into a separate element. So um, let's pick another material to apply. So let's see what we have for other materials. So we have cork floor, oak floor, default floor, uh, cementerous back, backer board, analytical floor. So this cork floor, though, doesn't look like it has an image file associated with it. But let's say I wanted to put a, a different floor system in the kitchen, and I want it to go a different direction than the rest of the floor. Um, uh, I can um, do that by, let's do a little bit of, of setup first here, if I have the time, I think I do. Um, if we go into Manage and click on Materials, I'm going to duplicate that oak floor. I am sh showing you a little bit of how you can edit these things already. So Materials is not something we've really dealt with yet, but Materials have um, the material name, and then it has a whole bunch of attributes applied to it that make that material show up a certain way, okay? So I want to duplicate this material and asset so that I create a whole new material with a whole new set of assets that I can apply to that material. So let's duplicate material and assets, and I'm going to rename this um, Life Proof Floor. Has anybody, I can't remember the, I think it's Pergo or something like that is the name that does life proof, but they're the, you know, vinyl composite floor systems that are great for kitchens because they, uh, they, they hold up to any, any damage and things that you can do in the kitchen. So we're just, I'm just calling it a life, life proof floor for that reason. Um, over here under graphics, if I want the size of the, um, pattern that I'm using for life proof, proof floors to be a six inch parallel, Instead of three inch, I can make that change here. So that's gonna show up with a wider pattern now. And then under appearance, I can bring in an image file that matches the material image of the, the floor system that I'm using. And I can also edit that, that image file. Uh, we're not really doing anything uh, rendering wise yet. So I'm only concerned right now about the graphics. And um, I also may wanna take that um, image file and or, and rotate it and change the pattern. So there's the pattern and how it associates with the image file. So when you're in this graphics and you have a particular pattern you have here, this six inch parallel pattern is going in only one direction. If I would like it to go in another direction, I can duplicate that pattern. Let's call it six inch parallel 90 degrees and change the angle to 90, but keep the um, spacing at six inches. So now it's gonna create parallel lines at six inches in a 90 degree direction instead. And you can see it changed here. So I'm gonna associate that uh, graphic foreground pattern with this new life proof floor and apply that. And now I have that particular life proof floor to be able to add to the kitchen. So I can go over here to uh, modify again, paint that material on here. And pick the kitchen and now the floor system in the kitchen is the 90 degree angle six inches apart um, instead of the regular uh, three inch flooring for the rest of the oak flooring for the rest of the house. So you've kind of gotten a sneak peek as to how you can control materials and graphics within a material, how you could probably create your own unique material if you wanted to and associate it with a particular graphics hatch pattern, okay? So that's another area you can start playing around with with this Craftsman project and decide how you want it to look. How do you want it to graphically display, okay? And we, we really have... Um, of four different finishes here because you might want to, for instance, the, the decking outside um, might want to look different than um, the floor systems that you have on the inside. And maybe you find a pattern that has 
a double line pattern that shows the nickel gap for the decking or something like that, okay? Um, so that's your, that, that is uh, the finishes and material editor we covered a little bit today too, okay? So we're really looking at everything like graphically. How does everything look graphically and how can we make improvements on it, okay? Anybody have any other things you want to touch on with the last four minutes of class or? <laughs> All right, I think I've run out of time for anything else. So um, uh, just to reiterate, this week, this week, I have opened the module for customizing annotation. But if you notice the due date, the due date is not until after we get back from March break. So next week, I'm going to do a little bit more of an in-depth deep dive in some of the things that we do already have videos for. So if, you, if you're ready and you're ahead of the game and you want to get started on it, go for it. Because there's some videos in here that you can. But nothing is due next week. So those of you who are a little bit behind, please take this time to get caught up with your Craftsman project um, so that you have these annotation elements and things that you can start playing with, okay? And everything I showed you today are certainly things you want to consider when you're using Revit. Um, uh, and I, I, would, I would encourage you to set up a view template and, um, and uh, think about the graphics representations of things in Revit. If you have questions for me, jot them down. How do I do this if I want it to look like this? How do I do that if I want it to look like that? And I can point you in the right direction. I've been stumped before too, and I usually can still find something or show you a good video that shows you how to, how to, how to do that particular thing. So keep those things in mind. Keep yourself a little list of what you would like to learn. Um, the videos, the things we're going to be changing next, next week is you're going to learn how to change the look and appearance of your uh, room tags, your dimension style. Um, the door and window callouts, if you don't like the default ones that are din done in Revit, you want to rather have like a, an oval-shaped door tag instead of this uh, slot-shaped door, door tag. If you want your window tags to be square rather than hexagon, we're going to cover all that. You're going to make your own custom title block next, next week. Um, and we're also going to uh, update the look of the view labels and uh, the levels on the um, – um, on the uh, elevations and section views. And so you're going to, by the end of this lesson, know how to get at every single one of those things and customize it if you need to. Okay, and that's what we're doing next week. Make sense? So this week's kind of catch up or playing around with things I showed you today. Next week, we're diving into customizing the stuff in, in, in Revit. Is that clear? Okay, okay. all right, good. Um, this will be posted like I do every week. So if you want to go back and try any of these things out, you'll have a chance to see them in this video. Okay. All right. Thank you. well, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a lovely weekend. Kenneth, have are you back time. in, are you back in the States now? Welcome back. Yeah, I got here at two in the morning. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't slept anything right away from the airport. I got here. Yeah, slept and at um eight ten I had the orthopedics appointment, so they took the cast off. Oh well, that's progress. Okay, so I haven't slept at all because I couldn't oh, sleep no. on the plane. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to have you back. Um, I I had uh, agreed to meet with Kim after class. So did you have okay. something you needed to chat with me about or? Well, I was going to ask you about um, the uh, technical illustration, but but I can just reach out after. If you sent, yeah, send me, a, send me an email about it. And if you and I need to set yeah. up a Zoom meeting um, at some point this week. Also, remember, I have my, I have my drop in lab tomorrow from 345 to 515. If oh, then that that's works. totally okay. Then okay, I'll, then I'll and I'll be to I'll be around tomorrow morning too in my office. Okay. Oh, okay. So, All right. So yeah, cool. yep. Yeah. All, right. All right. All right. Thank you. Welcome back. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Kim. I let me bring up your email. Um, then... I'm so sorry. I really.